Yeah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Greetings to you all. This is your co-host. Well, this is your, this is one of the co-hosts of the Fudger Club, Nafisa Buze. And with me is my other co-host, Akil Ingram. Uh, and one of our co-hosts will be joining us shortly, hopefully. And this is episode two, pretty much, of the Fudger Club podcast. And we apologize for you guys for um, starting a little bit late. However, the episode is pretty much called The Viewing or Viewing the World Through the Eyes of the New Muslim, which is an in-depth discussion uh, dealing with the first or in the, sort of the first stage of the cognitive model that was laid down by our co-host and the framework was uh, put together by our co-host, Abdul Haqq I killed Ingram to pretty much shed, shed some more light on that. No, you, you pretty much you pretty much mentioned it. What we what we want to begin to address in this particular discussion, or at least open the discussion of, is the the experience of and the service provided to an individual who has newly embraced the faith. Um, and 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 we say that and we speak to that from from personal experiences. Uh, ourselves as individuals and engaging with other peoples who have who have newly em embraced the faith. Okay. And can you finish elaborating? Sure. So we can open this discussion, and I'll I'll speak to my own personal experience. Um, I embraced Islam pretty young, as a as a teenager, um, about thirteen years old or so, and. Islam uh, in the in the early 90s, it didn't come to me uh, by way of the internet and, and things of that nature. Uh, I had never uh, been to a masjid before, um, didn't know what one was, all of that. Uh, I, I simply came across a couple of Muslims who lived in my neighborhood and, and embraced Islam on that. Now, interestingly enough, uh, after having embraced the faith, um, I was not able to engage with those individuals anymore for about two to three years. So I had a large gap of a disconnect of anything that, that had to do with Islam other than the little bit of information I had uh, prior to embracing the faith of Islam. And um, this type of experience, it can be reflected in what many people experience today in that many people today are embracing the faith of Islam or learning about the faith of Islam, not necessarily by them engaging with Muslims or being at a masjid or such. They see Islam in, in the media. They, they see Islam on the internet. They search on the internet. And this is becoming a, a, a common uh, motif now at this point where you come across people that they embrace Islam solely off of the information that they've come across online and in that they often experience a large gap as well and it is a it is a very lonely space to exist in and it is also a space where there is a lot of inaccurate uh, information that a, a person may come across and it can be very daunting and it can be uh discouraging for some to continue on with the faith. Now, from this group, you will find people who will eventually uh, reach out, those who are more assertive, reach out to, to the community, find a masjid or come across a Muslim, um, something of, of, of this nature. Um, and then those, we can attempt to catch them, but this is an, an ongoing issue. And I'll raise, uh, I'll raise a second thought, and this is something that I think more people will be familiar with. And, um, and I'll speak to uh, the area where I am in the uh, what they call the DMV, the, the DC, Maryland, Northern Virginia area, or in the Baltimore area as well, because I function throughout the entire of that, of that space. Um, there was a time where it was not uncommon to come across uh, up to five Shahadas in a week. Um, at this point, now, right now, real time, we may be experiencing um, two to three new shahadas um, within every couple week period. 
And what is interesting is that this is how it goes. Um, an individual will come to the masjid with a friend. They want to come on Friday. They want to come on Jumu'ah. They want to wait until after Jumu'ah. And then they want the imam of the masjid or the khatib to sit with them and give them their shahada. So then that happens. And then after this experience, I would say 70% um, of the time, you don't hear anything else back from that person from that point <laughs> forward. And But what's interesting, though, is that these people still identify with Islam, but they, they, they have no understanding or practice of the faith. And they're out there functioning in society. And then maybe uh they they come back around sometime later later maybe a few months maybe a few years but mm -hmm. they've been representing the faith of islam and they haven't been able to spiritually develop themselves throughout that period of time so um these are two challenges that that i think that um are quite common and, and need to be addressed and solutions should be provided for yes um i i, I totally agree with you um brother akil as far as my experience of being an imam for the um last past eight years or so i witnessed some of that as myself some people coming into islam and the way that they have been exposed to islam and when they do come you might see them on a friday for example they they, they might meet the resident khatib or the imam you know they exchange some pleasantries introduce themselves and so forth and then you don't see from them you don't hear or see them you know like you said it can be months months later it can actually be you know what I'm saying a year later or so that you might hear from them and that challenge of how their spiritual development is taking process you won't even know because you lose contact with them and i think um what i wanted to address a little bit just dealing with the framework so that those people who are watching can understand if you didn't catch the first episode we're talking about the founding stages the first stage in the cognitive model that our brother laid down was you find that when people come in to islam first when they first first come into islam you have this um eagerness i know for me myself i was when i came into islam i was extremely you know eager i wanted to learn everything at that time and you know you, know, you read stuff and you hear about things and the first thing you want to you know but you get a little bit sad because you don't see the same thing that you read in the books or you know the stories of the companions and the prophets when you meet other muslims so that was one of my experience you know coming into islam so i just wanted to to, to, to take a look at that there's two things that are taking place here. Mm -hmm. One, there is an individual obligation once you begin your quest as taking your shahada. Let's just say your, your shahada is the starting of your quest. There is an individual obligation there on the individuals themselves, all right? And later on, maybe in the show, I will bring some, you know, some proofs to highlight that. Then there's this communal um, sense, this community sense thing, brotherhood or sisterhood, this camaraderie that you're looking for or that is a part of Islam, okay and then it approaches from that perspective as well so i want to take a look at both of them hopefully to probably provide some answers or some solutions to these challenges that we see people coming to islam don't further their spiritual development like you're saying and two you know uh the way that they might be exposed to islam right yeah absolutely absolutely and what, what i would offer um I, I think this should be looked at one, like you're saying, from the perspective of the individual, and then from the perspective of ourselves, um, with regards to a person that has newly embraced the faith of Islam. And with regard to the, the individual, what I would submit um, the new Muslim focus on, and also those that are engaging with the new Muslim, uh, focus on two areas, and that is spirituality and prayer. Aqidah and Salah. That uh, firstly, there needs to be focus on the building of the faith of the individual and the theology of the individual, uh, the, the beliefs of the individual, learning who Allah is and what our relationship should be with him, um, learning about our, our belief system and what we do and do not believe, and utilizing that to build a relationship with Allah as well as the creation of Allah. Um, now, this is something that will build faith in the individual. And of course, as you build the faith, then 
it requires faith in order to perform the actions of the faith. So the more we can build the faith, the more we can we can perform the actions of Islam. And secondly, I would say to learn to pray and then actually praying uh, consistently like in real life, right? right? And if we can achieve those two, then we'll find that many of the other areas of the faith will organically begin to fall into place. However, if we enter into the other areas of the faith before we're stable in spirituality and in prayer, then it can become uh, quite challenging to, to maintain our, our spiritual maintenance and our spiritual, our spiritual growth. Um, now, that's with regard to the individual. With regards to ourselves, we can't take responsibility away um, from ourselves. And I mean this as the collective of the seasoned Muslims or the organizations that are in place in order to service the Muslims and the non-Muslims as well. Um, that may be the, the, the masjid, uh, that may be some other form of a, of a nonprofit or some other uh, service that Muslims are providing uh, for the people. Now, I believe that at this point, we, we have to be a bit more, um, we're beyond the mom and pop phase. We just are, right? So we, we need to be a bit more pointed and we, we need to look into uh, customer relationship management systems. This is really what we, what we need and how we need to look at it. And in that, um, when the people are coming in, we, we need to kind of know, um, you know who the person is, what their contact information is, we need to be able to um, have a, a committee of people that are engaging with them. We need some tasks uh, for them to be able to complete and provide an orientation for them so that they can become settled in the faith and they know that they're being supported throughout this process. Um, be, because again, their entire, their entire worldview often is, is changing. Um, they're, they're no longer as relatable to their friends and family as they used to be. And uh, having a support system to allow them to be able to uh, engage with that and navigate that, I, I think would be something that holds high value. Yes, and I, and I totally agree. If we could set up a program or, or Masajids can set up programs or Dawa centers or any organization, as you mentioned, can set up programs where they have an ori uh, orientation phase uh, where they actually, you know, gather information of the individual who comes into Islam and help them along with that process step by step. I think that should be set, I mean, responsibility. Also, I would add to the responsibility of that community that that new Shahada come into is that when giving someone a Shahada, I think now we have to really pretty much give them like a class, give them some more detailed information uh, pertaining to the Shahada itself so that they can understand the individual obligation that they have as far as you know their spirituality as far as that no one else can you know come in and just help them out in their spirituality as far as the obligation they have to have they have to do that themselves but if they're not that not if that not made known or clear to them at the time they they're given their shahada sometimes they leave with the sense of okay i might get back to it or you understand what i'm saying or okay right, maybe right. i they don't develop on it but if if you explain to them like no this is an actual covenant that you're taking with your lord and you are required now that you have taken the shahada you have to do x y and z and to begin to build that you have to be, build this relationship to your creator as far as learning about who he is you know his name is actually so forth and so on and educating them and then directing them to where they can further that education at you know and i and, and i know some people might say well all of this might not be needed at the time because a person is you know just taking their shahada i mean this is no proof and evidence that you had to give them all of this but i honestly um I, I, I beg to disagree because of the time that we're living in now and the fact that most of the people who are converts, they don't know Arabic. So in, in terms, they don't understand what the Shahada actually entails. You're having them right. repeat a statement behind you and, and you're translating the statement for them. And they still don't know what that statement actually means. And sometimes the person who's giving them Shahada don't really understand the, the implication of the statement themselves. So I think that you should at that point teach them further so that they can, and this is all and very important because again, at this founding stage, as you mentioned, their worldview is shaping. You understand what I'm saying, Brother Akil? Their Absolutely. worldview is shaping. So at this time, you're playing an instrument 
instrumental role in developing their worldview. You understand what I'm saying? When giving them the Shahada. So I think that part, you know, should be understood. There is a twofold responsibility taken there. Um, and like you said, the communities nowadays, instead of uh, being too preoccupied with multiple different things, and I know we can be, the communities can be busy, and I'm talking about organizations and massages now. I believe that they should develop a program where they become more community outreach in terms of being familiar with each member of your community, whether new one or old one, you understand? So they can feel that brotherhood or that sisterhood that they're going to need, not only at the time of marriage, when you're filling out an application and you want to get married, not at the time of when you want counseling, not just only be at the time, but at the time of your very intake of coming into Islam, you should know that, hey, I have a community. I am a part of a community. You, you understand? I contribute and that community actually helps. Right, absolutely. And when we're speaking to CRM, when we're speaking to customer relationship management, um, it doesn't have to be overly sophisticated in the beginning. It can be an Excel spreadsheet. It can be something like Podio. Um, it could be it could be something that is along this type of a line. It's just some way of of, of tracking um, who the person is, what their name is, how do, how do we contact them, um, how do we how do we invite them out, who is maintaining the relationship with them, who is the person that brought them in to take their shahada. Because a lot of times that person, we don't necessarily have a, a strong relationship with, right? That person may be only coming around on Jumu'ah or every few Jumu'ahs or so. Um, so to your point, we, we also, uh, I, would, I would submit that we, we need to be aware of where the person is coming from that is coming into the faith. And I'll, I'll unpack what I mean by that. Um, people learn differently. And people are coming into Islam with different motivations. So when I say that people learn differently, um, some people can sit down uh, with a book in front of a teacher and, and be okay with that in person. Um, other people, they, they learn better by way of audio, others by way of video. Other people, especially today, many people are learning on their own, in their own free time at their leisure, on their phones right in, in their homes on the way to work or whatever they're doing not necessarily just inside of the masjid itself and um there there are other people that when they're coming into the faith they're they're coming to the faith because of the character of the muslims not necessarily the information that is available it's because of their experience with some other muslims um other people it is the information so they 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 value data right and it can go to the other side of the spectrum even, and this is a, a real-time experience. I remember about a decade ago, we, we had this flash of, of youth that were embracing the faith of Islam. I mean, as young as uh, 12 years old, nine years old, coming to the masjid on their own, wanting to embrace the faith of Islam. And you know, we're like, all right, you, you sure you understand? I'm there, where, where, where's your mother, where, where's your father? Are they okay? That type of, but these people were actually serious. And um, with that though, what we eventually learned with some of these teenagers that were coming in um, is that they were intrigued with Islam, but they also were deeply involved into street life and street culture. So, so because of that, they were actually creating um well their own fraternities as it were right uh some of us will call them gangs right so so they would create their own system of operating in the streets and then utilizing their identity their identification with islam as a part of their code so we would get people coming to the masjid um in droves young guys teenagers mid-teens early 20s embracing islam and their main concern was, okay, okay, so when do I get my Aki name? I want my Aki name, hmm. right? And to them, that was a marker to say that they were officially a part of this private fraternity that they created for themselves in the streets, right? So as a part of their code, you have to come to the masjid, hmm. uh, take your Shahada with the Imam, and then you have to be granted your Aki name, as they call it. And now you're officially a part of their group, 
right? Mm. And then once you have that, they can go out and begin operating how they were operating, right? Uh, one of the groups they call themselves the Kufi Boys and whatever else they were calling themselves, right? And they were out and, and they were involved in, in behavior that is um, unbecoming of a Muslim. And it was actually, it was literally to the point where principals of schools in, in, the, in the area, where uh, individuals involved with the, uh, with the police, um, uh, captains of the police force and such were coming to us asking us to come out and engage with these individuals in their schools or um, in their in their other places of, of, of work to try to curb this problem because they realized that this wasn't what Islam represented. But nevertheless, these young guys are intrigued with Islam and they weren't listening to them and they know they would listen to us. So I say that to say that there is some degree of a disconnect at times of us functioning inside of the masjid within our own four walls and what is going on outside of the masjid in the streets in colleges in the in the workplace in the military because these this is where the people are who are embracing islam and they aren't necessarily coming to us inside of our buildings uh all the time and consistently so this actually requires of us to be able to go out to them and engage with them if we're going to be able to, to manage this problem and and honestly you're right we do need to develop you know when i say this that it would be better that you know organizations like you said and massages should develop a outreach and program where they can educate individuals such as like you said in these fields or these areas that are embracing islam but doesn't come all the way to those buildings or to the masjid instead of being in, you know enclosed and closing ourselves off Alhamdulillah, brother Abdul Haq Baker has just joined us. Assalamualaikum um, warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. How are you brothers doing? Now, the sound right. on the phone is not very loud, so I know you can hear me, no. but I think StreamYard's doing something with using phones, so you're going to have to speak up and give me that chance to hear you. And I want to, I want to apologize to you, my brothers, and those um, viewers, because we're experiencing something of... Uh, um, a new phase in UAE. We are now aligned mm -hmm. with our weekly um, calendar with the rest of the world. So literally we work on Fridays for half a day and then we have a two and a half day weekend. But those of us who are in management and leadership positions have not been able to realise that half day relaxation today. But from next week, it shouldn't happen again. So I'm explaining so, and mit the mitigating circumstances. So again, apologies, but I'm here for the rest of the show, inshallah. Barakallahu feet. As you know, and as I was saying that I think like you're saying, I kill just piggybacking off what you're saying. You're right that the outreach should be there. But I do want to remind organizations and massages that when it comes to situations such as you have just described, they should not place the blame upon themselves in regards to this or should feel any type of way because it's out of their control. And I'm going to use an example of Masjid al And it comes in sort of the Toba, Allah Jalla talks about that, telling the Prophet not to deal with these individuals. They had an ill intent from the beginning. They wanted the Prophet to come pretty much give them like a tazkiyah, you know, if he prayed in their masjid. But they, they weren't, they didn't build a masjid on a foundational point of taqwa, as Allah mentioned to them. You know, it wasn't that. So Allah told the Prophet don't stand in their, in their masjid. So when you have individuals who come in with an intent, like you're saying, the Kufi boys, not for the information, not for Islam and what it stands for, but for their own version and to create their own game and have their own identity, then that is something that the Muslims, I believe, should not feel any, um, should have, should feel any uh, way about that because that's out of our control. You understand? From, yeah, from what, I, from what I could hear, mashallah, yeah, I'm, in, I'm in agreement with you. And if I may, I know you've been discussing up until now. I wanted to, from what you're saying about those who bring their own identity and everything, very good points that from what I could hear from you on that. But I wanted to revisit the framework that we're discussing, the framework that um, I um, prepared. And I want to make it clear. There's, there's something in some of the discussions that were taking place in the WhatsApp groups, which I think were excellent. We've got to be clear on one thing. Whenever academia is brought into the dean 
and you have those who have studied, okay, you'll find that there are um, elements among us who have not studied, okay, but they may have picked up on religious learning, which is good, which is commendable, but they're not approaching that religious learning with the discipline of what is required from study. And what they end up doing is they start condemning or casting aspersions upon the academia of those who have studied that route. And that's, that's secular knowledge. But also, they will then, as we've seen, do likewise with those who have studied religious knowledge and gone through the faculties and the procedures in that regard. So I think it's very important that I mention this at this point because some may feel, okay, he's bringing a framework, what's it got to do with the Dean and everything like this? And this is um, underpinned by Dean and you confirm that in your review, um, um, uh, which was really, really good, Brother Nafis. You confirmed that when you were looking at it, because I think you were addressing some of those um, potential questions that might come. Okay, Quran and Sunnah, Quran and Sunnah. The Quran and Sunnah is comprehensive. It's comprehensive, and you'll find that it covers every aspect of life, knowledge, and learning. From engineering, from science, from education. So those who are approaching it from a very, very basic perspective, more often than not, they're threatened by this. This is why they want to diminish it. And they should understand this is actually complementing, confirming the efficacy of the Dean and the comprehensiveness of the Dean. So I applied those, that, that framework when I was interviewing um, the Muslims I was um, um, deal, engaging with when I was doing participant observation. And I will say, share this with you from a British context. A number of individuals who read my work, lay people came to me and said, we wish we knew we were going through this because we would have understood where we should have been with regards to development on the Dean and what we were facing and going through from a socio-cultural perspective. We had no idea, we just had that idealism. We had that abstract approach, thinking this is what the Sahaba did, and we applied it, and we found that we became strange in our society, which strangeness is not wrong in and of itself, but they found the men mental health issues, they found a lot of things that they weren't fitting into the Muslim communities because they just didn't understand what was happening to them as converts. And I think that we could speak to that because we didn't have anyone holding our hand. We just had abstract knowledge and the application of that abstract knowledge, which then became a dystopia instead of the utopian ideals we were seeking. Okay, so let me submit this thought to you. Um, do you believe that there is a misunderstanding in the purpose and function of academia and how going through that process can service our understanding and practice of the faith is it do you think that is where that is where some of that is coming from uh, how would you kind of how would you kind of posture that i think that's a very good um, observation um brother Akil. and yes i do i think that is an aspect that and it is emanating from those again you have to look at where it's coming from and by and large, it's coming from those who haven't studied, who yeah, haven't that's, that's completed um, rudimentary academia, secular knowledge. And I'm not saying that, that in, 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 in absolutes, because many, many haven't completed that, but they've still embarked religiously upon the discipline of learning. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? They've embarked upon it. They've found it challenging. Like I know, for example, a uh, student of knowledge, European, white European, when he came out to Medina, in order to learn the Arabic, and th they said, you are going to have to go back to secondary school. This was a 24-year-old young man. Mm -hmm. And he went into an Arabic secondary school and was with um, 12 graders. They looked at him, person with a beard and everything. But he understood that I need to come back to this. This isn't for everyone. In order... For me to get the fundamentals to grasp the basics 
and move forward. He actually started teaching me Arabic and he's the only person to this day, I don't speak Arabic fluently and everything, he moved and he's in Riyadh now, Alhamdulillah. He, for today, to date, he is the only one who taught me Arabic in a way that I could comprehend and how oh, yeah. children learn. Because he went through that process and he's one of the strongest Arabic speakers that I know, mashallah, tabarakallah. So what, what I would say to round off just the, the answer in part to what you've said, because I don't want to go on as long and I want a, a brother Akil to be speaking today, mashallah. But I think it comes down to what you were saying in the f follow up chats, uh, chats, um, brother Nafis. There needs to be, you said two things, which I loved. Sincerity, ikhlas, and there needs to be humility. And when we have those two, we can be really good receptacles of learning. And, and, and Nafis, this is a very important point that you made. And I think we need to emphasize that. And we're, to, we're talking about the conversion stage, converts. We came into the Dean with a lot of haughtiness, arrogance, um, rivalry. This is how we used to project ourselves. And we can go into all the psychoanalysis of that. Was it because of what we faced, the legacy of slavery, oppression and everything. All of that can be discussed another time. But the point of the matter is that coming to learning, whether it's academic, secular or religious, which is the, the, the peak religious, we need to ensure that we come with sincerity and humility. And if we do not come with that, do not embark upon the pathway of learning because you will not be learning you'll just be gathering information. And it would bring, brings me to the hadith um, where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi warned about um, getting knowledge to compete with the scholars and to debate and argue and everything. And we're in that time now, especially amongst the Salafis. Yes, it happens amongst other denominations and everything, but we've seen what's happened amongst our community. So again, I've three times the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to emphasize things. This is my third time. Ikhlas and humility. And then, brother, brother Akil, if those are in place, irrespective of the individual's lack of um, knowledge or training or the pathway of academia, he or she will be ready to learn. They will be ready to absorb and to practice if they have these two ingredients, characteristics, inshallah. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Nafis. Yeah, what I was going to say is uh, someone asked the question in terms of the difference between the uh, study of academia and as, as the study of the religion and how them two, how they how two of them coincide with one another or support one another. I just wanted to make something clear. Yeah, also in regards to a call. Please talk up a little bit, Nafis, as I said, my sound is really yeah, bad. I just want to make something real clear. The also the origin of a caller, when they call, they have to make sure they take in the uh taking the state and the condition of the people that they're calling so some people don't have an academia back academic background some people don't have that type of uh being being way of of learning so for example you know you, you look at the hadith of mu'ad when the prophet وسلم, sent him you know to the people of the book he gave him some beautiful instructions all right in regards to the people that you're calling, giving them some background. Okay, you're going to the people of the book, make sure that you do X, Y, and Z. But allowing, allowing him to know the people that he was going to gave him an advantage to know how to direct that dollar. Okay, right. if I'm going to apply this. The ayat where Allah Jawala says, we have not sent any message except that we sent them in the tongue, as we mentioned before, of the people to speak in that language. The Athar of Ali ibn Abi Talib, where he says, when you speak to the people, speak to them where they can understand. He wants them to deny Allah and his messenger. I think what I'm trying to say is that all of these things coincide to the fact that you need the caller need to be able to gauge the audience he's talking to. If that person needs an academic approach and the caller doesn't possesses that that approach, meaning that they may have not been, uh, been disciplined or studied in regards to that, then a little bit more to what Abdul Haq is saying, they shouldn't belittle it because it's academic. They shouldn't make it seem as if it's something foreign to Islam to learn that way. Shaker Thameen, he made a beautiful point when he was mentioning uh, about the, uh, the, the the title headings and something that's called as uh, um they call bab uh, they, they call them uh babs you know what I'm talking about uh web and stuff like that these breaking down of terminologies categorizations 
different things which you see in fiqh and, 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 and you see in mustala hadith. He says, somebody might ask you and say, okay, during the time of the prophets, this wasn't there. During the time of the companions, these breaking down or categorizations wasn't there. It wasn't this, 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 and that. Someone might make this argument. So Shikha Jameen said, this falls under another principle that what? We do this so that we can make it easier now, right? Um, Brother Akil can help me out with this. We can make it easier now for others can understand. So it doesn't innovate into the dean. You didn't you didn't add anything new to the dean by bringing in this approach, this academic approach to help out. You understand? You didn't, you know what I'm saying? So they, they can get it. So, okay, we got these categorizations. We got this, this many conditions. We got this many, et cetera, et cetera, even though the companions didn't need that. You understand what I'm saying? But just to make it more easier for other people, it developed into that. But that doesn't, you understand? I'm trying to hopefully that show you how they both can complement each other. That's what I was trying to do. I don't know if I did a poor well, job. Let me, let me dovetail your point. <clears throat> and um, I, I believe something that we should acknowledge is the difference between the Eastern educational system and the Western educational system with regards to its approach to education, right? With regards to its pedagogy. And, and what I mean by that is what is commonplace in the Eastern uh, educational system is that there is a focus on, let's say, memorization, often rote memory. And then from there, get to understand it. Whereas in the Western educational system, uh, we may find a focus more so on, on understanding and concepts often in the abstract. And mm. then throughout that, that process, uh, coming into some form of, of memorization. So it's mm. two opposite tracks, um, but the goal is one of the same in the end. And I, I, I mentioned this because when we are engaging with peoples that are that are new to the faith and they're entering into the faith, um, we may not realize that the training that we have gone through in, in the East is different than the way people are used to receiving information in, in the West, right? On, on, top of the, on top of the fact in Eastern training, we are learning traditional sciences of our faith, but we aren't necessarily learning, for example, uh, education as a field of study. We aren't necessarily mm. learning psychology as a field of study. We aren't necessarily learning pastoral care as a field of study, right? Mm -hmm. Yet these are some of the services that are needed in order to reach them where they are when a person is coming into the faith. And in bridging that gap, uh, we may be able to uh, curve or to suppress um, some of the extremism that can come out in the initial phases of the faith when we come in and we're taking everything in its literal in its literal sense and not understanding that we're taking it in a literal sense based on what we understand it to mean in English and in Western culture and not necessarily what it may actually mean as intended by Allah, as intended by his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I thought that's a point that should be should be highlighted. And that was a beautiful observation that you made too, Brother Akil. Thank you for that, um, putting that in there so eloquently. You know, I was fumbling around here, <laughs> here my brother, uh, Abdul Haq Baker, but it is, it is important, you're right, in regards to understanding a little bit the difference between the Eastern approach of study of religion and and as far as the Western approach of how they study information or how they take in information, their education system is a contrast. So when Brother Abdul Haq Baker is saying is that, okay, we get these brothers who may have studied in the dean, but then they are pretty much not aware of these uh, nuances, if you, if you say, if you will. They are, not, they are not aware of them. So when they come back to the West, to the people that they're going back to, when they want to approach Islam, it doesn't sort of pretty much, you know, it, it, you know, show a level of respect for those who actually did study um, and uh, are um, aware of this academic approach. So it makes the student look a little bit kind of crazy, you know, because he's out of touch with the people that he's talking to or he's, he's making it seem as he's belittling that academic process. Um, yeah. And just to go back to a little bit of that founding stage so that we can stay a little bit on topic here. And I, and I appreciate Brother Duhak Baker bringing in that point with his framework, is that I honestly believe that the new Muslim world is being shaped at the beginning, not in the end. 
And that's why I keep thinking it's so detrimental that they understand the difference of the roles here. Allah has a verse where he says, Man jahada, whoever strives, for in the ma nafsi. Whoever strives, they strive for the benefit of their own self. Allah says, Man amila salihan, right? Whoever does a righteous action, then they do it what? For nafsi, for themselves. The point I'm trying to make with these two verses is that there is an individual obligation upon the person who's beginning his quest, the new Muslim. No matter where you at academic, no matter where you at education, no matter where you at period. If you accept Islam and it's made understood, you're taking a shahada. It becomes an individual obligation and responsibility upon you from the onslaught of your quest. You need to understand it. That needs to be made understood to them. So they can realize that Allah is not going to question them about the community that they were in, whether or not the community actually provided for them this information. Allah is going to question them in regards to the covenant which they suppose that to fulfill with the shahada. That's one thing. The second thing I want to make understood that when Allah talks about community, he mentions something very key when it comes to community. Allah says, All right, showing that the believers are what? Nothing but helpers, friends, and confidants, etc., etc., to one another. They commanded good and they prohibited evil, showing the stability that's brought forth from a community, community obligation, right? How they actually interact with one another, how they remind one another, how they uphold the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in order to function as a social community, right? Well, you see, on Allah have a Rasul. Allah says, then they obey Allah and they obey his messenger. That's the Sharia. They obey that. Then Allah said, say, Allah. These are those, if they do all of these following things as a community, Allah will have mercy upon them, etc. I think you get the point what I'm saying, right? I feel in regards to this, that you know, the communal obligation is that. They uphold the sharia of Allah. They remind, they command that which is good. They exalt that which is good, and they prohibit that which is evil. Okay, I'm not saying that they do this without knowledge, of course, and I'm not saying that they do this hastily, and they don't have patience and forbearance. I'm saying that if they understand these things, this is what the community does. So that's what I wanted the, the new, the, and I'm about to stop right now. That's what I want the new shahada to understand. You're coming into a twofold individual obligation and a communal obligation how do you make them to how do you bridge the gap between the two that's something i hope we can provide in the show uh i feel you got something to add to that or do hot speaker yep go uh, ahead Aki. sure so let's build on your thought process of, of communal obligation right and um i'm going to mention something and for sake of time i'm going to kind of combine it uh, okay. i'll speak to a um a conversation that uh, I have with Sheikh Saleh Suhaimi, uh, as well as Sheikh Ibrahim al uh Sheikh Fahru Fahid, and Sheikh Ahmed, all, all separate occasions. And we were speaking about um, kind of prioritizing our efforts in the in the West. Okay, and uh, with without fail, something that was common that was mentioned across the board uh, from them was that you all are in the place that is the epitome of kufr and shirk right mm. of, of of disbelief and creation worship this is the source of where it's coming from in the entire world as our postmodern world exists it's coming from there so understanding this if that is the case your focus should be more so on iman and kufr to heed and shirk than the other areas of the faith, right? Your, your, your focus uh, should be on the non-Muslims and the areas that they have challenges with and inviting them to the, to the faith of Islam, right? Uh, also, similarly, I had a conversation some years ago with Sheikh Salem Ibn Sa'ad al -Tawil. May Allah preserve all of them. Amen. And uh, even when we are looking to some of the, the newer Muslims, that have come into the faith after we have engaged with these non-Muslims who are now becoming Muslims. Um, we, how can we not? How can we not prioritize our effort to these people when they are the majority of the people that we're dealing with? Um, the majority of the Muslims that are actually around us are newer Muslims than they are seasoned Muslims. How can we not prioritize that? Right? Yet. Um, I've come into this particular challenge. I would like to hear if you all have come into this particular challenge as well. Yet, when we have the person that is new to the faith, 
and we are we're thinking about what to do for them. Maybe it's a maybe it's a book to give them to read. Maybe it is uh, some type of service we want to provide to them. And we have to think, OK, what book can I actually give this person that's appropriate for you where you are? Right. Mm -hmm. What service can I connect you with that's appropriate for you where you are right now? Because many of our services are actually pointed toward the seasoned Muslim, uh, the more developed Muslim than it is the person that is that is newer to the faith. We don't have a lot of those materials and a lot of those services. There have there has been an increased effort in more recent years, but it's not sufficient, right? But mm -hmm. but it's not sufficient. So I say this just to speak to what we are prioritizing, right? Because sometimes we get so uh, pigeonholed, and we we speak to issues that are very important and they're also very sensitive, but we we don't realize that we may be speaking to let's say five to 10,000 people when really there are millions of other people that need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. I think some very good points there from both of you. I, I would come at it from this perspective. Again, I, I developed these um, frameworks in, in working. Last week we spoke about acknowledging that we're not the dancing, singing, jack of all trades. We've got to see where we are positioned societally on the, in the wider macro context and on a community basis amongst the Muslims on a micro context. What do I mean by that? I developed a funnel theory positioning um, various uh, religious ideological delineations and groups according to a funnel where the gravitational pull and was towards marginalization, extremism, uh, we mentioned this last week, and where the various communities were positioned from the most liberal which is where the gravitational pull is very loose and, and, and free. And as it gets stronger to a more um, violent, extreme religious delineation. And charted across that funnel from the top to the bottom were various communities. The Salafi community being at the neck of the funnel where the gravitational pull towards extremism was strongest, but where the, the Salafi communities were the most effective in combating that toxicity at that particular stage as that pressure gets lighter as you move up the funnel you have other communities such as the muslim brotherhood sufi communities others further up right till you get to the top where there's no gravitational pull at all and you have that liberal progressive everything goes the mix everything is thrown in at the top there now why am i bringing this because once we can acknowledge where we are within a particular mosaic or framework within society then we can speak to our strengths in addressing the needs of those converts that come amongst us and i alluded to this last week in our discussions so theologically um uh, doctrinally with regards to worship and these important aspects that we are saying are the primary um uh, pr uh or priority matters that they need to deal with we are very well equipped to be doing that it's when we try to tell or inculcate or persuade those community members, those new Muslims, that we can provide them with everything else as well, from socio-economic to socio-educationally. And we are not equipped. We do not have the basis and the resources, human, financial or otherwise, to do that. And then that's when we start seeing, in some elements, areas, a ghettoization. We need to be connected more widely and acknowledge that there may be those further up the funnel that might have a very good educational system and can provide for those converts, those new Muslims in that area of a particular type of education. We heard as um, I was listening to um, one of the brothers, um, uh, Ali Davis, and he a very excellent talk he's doing to new Muslims. And he was speaking about um, a, an organization that had set up a medical center for the Muslims and non-Muslims to attend free of charge in the, of the region and the area that he was living in. We may not have those facilities there as well, and we may need to send our community members further up. What we have now, and other communities with del uh, other delineations have this as well, they don't want to let go of their cohort. 
they don't want to let go of their members, even if it's to the detriment of those members, because they're saying, if we let them go here and get education, if we let them go there to the Salafi communities to learn theology, then we will lose them and they will not be upon our ide ideology and our methodology. And I'm speaking to all Muslim communities in this instance now. We need to stop thinking in that micro insular perspective because it's destroying the chances, the opportunities for growth of those new members that come within the community. Now, I'm going to give an example. When I was speaking with Dr. Khalid Green, um, when he was studying in Yemen, and there were some brothers who came to Sheikh Mukbil. They were living in, I think it was Sana'a or in a different region. And they came to the Sheikh and they said, Sheikh, we live too far from you to be able to um, come to the classes. Our families are in another city. And Khalid explained this to me. And they sat with Sheikh Mukbil. And the, the college that or university they wanted to go to, they were firm in their Aqidah. They were firm in their Manhaj. They knew the inhiraf and the innovations of the institution generally. But for some of the sciences that were being taught, they asked Sheikh Mukbil, Rahim Allah, can we do this because of the situation that we're in environmentally? Sheikh Mukbil said yes. This is Sheikh Mukbil now. So my point is, we need to be able to discern when we cannot provide for the new converts in a particular area and having grounded them in the Akida, the Manhaj, the spiritual aspects, focus. We know that they are safe, like when we raise our children. There's a time when they have to leave and we have prepared them enough to go out into the world. All communities need to be able to have that maturity and concern for the overall development of those new Muslims that come into our community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you, you remind me of, of, of a point of horseback on what you're saying. Uh, I'll, I'll let in a little bit more on the discussion with Sheikh Salah Suhaimi, uh, may Allah preserve him, some, from some years ago. Um, and he was mentioning, uh, he was speaking to us, uh, us in America but I believe that this can extend out to the West broadly. He was saying that you all are a minority within a minority, right? And I will add to that within a minority, right? Where we have triple layer minorities. So because of that, he was saying that um, you all can't afford to split and, and divide yourselves, right? You can't afford that because you haven't grown to that level yet. Um, also, this reminds me of um, a statement that Sheikh Ubaid Jebedi had made this back in the late 90s, and where he was speaking, uh, he was actually speaking, um, giving advice to uh, our, our fellow our fellow Muslims in Britain. And he, he was saying that we can do and say some things in our country that you all can't do and say in, in, in your country, right? And um, I, I say those two things to say this. Um, there are over arcing challenges that the Muslims will be facing broadly uh, within these non-Muslim lands that we're living and functioning in. And because of those challenges being overarching and, and because there's a non-Muslim majority, when it comes to the, the non-Muslim majority, we can't afford to appear as though we are disunified in front of them. Right. We can't afford that right now. So with any type of challenges that we that we may have on a micro level, we may we may need to seek those things in certain settings, in certain environments in order to address those particular challenges. But on a macro level, uh, we don't need to make it appear as such. And I don't say this to say that we don't need to distinguish between Tawheed and Shirk because we do. I'm not, say, I'm not saying that we don't need to distinguish between Sunnah and Bid'ah, because we do. What I'm saying is, and, and, I, and I hope that I'm speaking to the point that you're making, Dr. Baker, we, we need to acknowledge that we are functioning on different levels of the societies that we live in, and we need to engage each facet of that society appropriately. And when we do that, it will create a proper import for those that are coming into the faith from outside of the faith of Islam. And I, 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 I totally, I totally agree. Hold up, until I, I totally agree that the uh, in regards to that, 
we have to stop pretty much worrying about those individuals who chose to place themselves on the olive. Just as the Sheikh Tishkafin is mentioning, and Duakil mentioning, if we're the minority of minority of minority, then we cannot keep focusing on those who chose to place themselves on the olive. And for those who are looking at those who place themselves on the island and do not want to interact and do not want to, you know, reach out, so to speak, to other people and expertise in areas that they can provide that they cannot provide and they fall short. And then they need to look at that as being something that is not correct, whether they are screaming menhags from the top of their lungs or whether they're screaming Aikida from the top of their lungs. It is not correct because the Prophet has demonstrated to us what? That even during the time when they would have captains that were uh, captives that was non-Muslim. In order for them to learn and to freedom, he would have them teach them how to read or so forth, right? He utilized the understanding that, okay, we might not have this expertise, but we have someone, even though they're not of the same faith, that can actually teach, you understand, and actually help. When those times or those, those, those scenarios are present themselves, then we need to do that. So if we need people and expertise as far as uh, social, as far as economics and so forth like that, then we need to reach out, especially when we're a minority. You understand? And, and since you mentioned Sheikh Mukbil, it's funny, uh, interesting enough, you mentioned him, Rahmatullah yeah. Ta'ala, it's already understood that he stayed in a language program that was taught by the Zay, uh, Zaydi Shiites, right? He stayed with them in their language program for at least about, he did like two uh, two terms in it um, in regards to not to go to their other, uh, uh, you know, their Akia course and everything like that. But he, he stayed really in the classes of the language, but he took it from them. Even though the Aikida wasn't the correct Aikida, it's still a time where you have to reach out. That's that's my point. I'm saying you're gonna have to branch out, and it shows us the importance. As Abdul Akil was just, I mean, uh, brother Akil was just saying, it shows the importance that unity is really, really uh, paramount. We need to be able to um, lease. Um, we can't afford. It's a disadvantage to be disunified. It's a disadvantage, especially when you're in a minority, to be disunified. But we need to stop at the same time wanting to work with others who don't see this as an issue, working with others who don't understand this as an issue, because some people are closed minded and some people don't understand certain things outside on a broader uh, scale. So we shouldn't focus on them. We should focus mainly so on reaching those massages and those organizations that are willing to uh, be unified and willing to step outside of the parameters, so to speak, so they can get things done for their community. As Dr. Hawk said, I'm gonna stop here, social, religious, social, economics, <laughs> right? And social, uh, I think he mentioned one more, uh, one, one more other thing, I think social spiritual, right? Um, so, social spiritual, about. yes, mashallah. Huh? And what I would say, um, uh, Brother Nafis, alhamdulillah, yeah. and, and, and yes, uh, just reinforcing uh, what Brother Akil and both of uh, what you said, um, everything was very pertinent. We're not saying um, unity in every aspect because that is not possible from a point of elements of socio-religiousness. No. Disunity will continue as long as there are elements and communities amongst us that are upon shirk and bidda. And we no. are not saying that there should be any compromise or negotiation whatsoever in that, in that in I'm, those talking about unit, I'm talking about unity within the brothers and the sisters no no i agree what i'm saying i'm speaking i'm speaking to yeah. the same point the same yeah. point i'm agreeing with you as akila's highlighted speaking to that um funnel uh, theory that i developed there are different levels there are different stages and we need to become more discerning as i've mentioned of the stages the three of us are here and I'm sure if we were to apply aspects of the framework and Dean and this, 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 this complete plethora of areas that we need to look at, we would be at different areas and levels according to these, these particular framework, religiously and academic. And there's nothing wrong with that. One thing that we are clear on, I think, with all three of us here, and hence why we are doing this show, hence why we are so connected, is that upon... Tawheed and upon the Sunnah, there is no disagreement, there is no disunity. And this should go out as a message to many others on a wider context that that is where the foundation needs to be built. And that's where it needs to end when you are crowning the communities that we are belonging to. So, not disunity um, 
in there will be disunity in some particular areas but we're looking to achieve unity in those areas which fosters development individually and collectively that's what i think is is um what needs to be emphasized and you've both emphasized that i think very very well i hope i've contributed um coming in late to that particular point and my cognitive development framework discusses all of that every aspect of that referencing the dean and referencing uh, the aspects as we've mentioned um the fees social economic social cultural social spiritual social educationally all of them embedded in the prophetic way of teaching and the sira embedded in various elements that are there in the quran and also when we look at um islamic societies as they were developing but one caveat we need to really mention here now is that we do not live in islamic societies so we should not be trying to replicate something micro or macro when the overarching framework is antithetical and that doesn't mean that we then embrace that overarching framework but it's like two bulls butting heads or but a bull butting its head against a mountain in trying to implement something that is not contextualized that is abstract and then it gives the impression of behavioral extremism and at its very worst ideological extremism which then places the spotlight on targeting our communities because hikmah hasn't been achieved by those who should be at that stage of wisdom because they're applying things out of context and they're dragging those new members and our sisters who are in the community whether new or established down that funnel and that gravitational pull which is only going to marginalize our communities and stifle them even more absolutely and to edify your point dr baker and I, i'll just be very very frank uh for sake of time i know we're coming up on time um we have to understand and accept that in the west we are pioneering right now we are uh creating history right now as we are working through these challenges in the, in the west to set framework and foundation for those who will be coming come, come, be coming after us and uh again i know that we're, we're coming into on time and nowhere after the one hour mark um nafis i don't know if you uh if you can pull it up or you saw it and I, I saw that uh chaplain lantigua uh, has some form of a comment that had come up maybe about uh 20 minutes ago or so a little more uh, i don't know if you can see it what was it pertaining to what was it pertaining um, to can you give me an it, insight what was it? It, it flashed and then it and then it dissipated oh no 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 that's what i placed up we addressed that we addressed that earlier about the difference between the religious uh um study and the academic study and how we could bring it up i addressed it someone else brought another question though honestly i can post it there for you guys to see real quick before we close out assalamu alaikum please consider that there may be people who see this who have no idea who the scholars you are referring to are and why they should be paid attention to Okay. I mean, if you want, if you want to address that, you can. If not, you know, we can say that for the next uh, show, or we can say that for the uh, Fudger Club Q and A. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a Fudger Club WhatsApp, guys. That is a Fudger Club Q and A where you can post what you felt about in each episode or some of your suggestions. I don't want you to feel shy. We have to remove ourselves from the taste that Muslims are feeling ostracized, and this concept of wanting to be comfortable around the non-believers and not comfortable around the believers. I think that's that playing a double face. Like we need to be able to open up a little bit. I mean, uh, hopefully people start opening up on Clubhouse. We was on Clubhouse. We see some people uh, wanting to uh, interact and some people just wanted to just pay attention and not say anything. No, open up a little bit. That's what they made those platforms for, to be social. Um, and I want you not to feel like you want to be ostracized because you say something. It's not like that. Like, we're not approaching it that way. You don't have to be 100% a scholar or a student of knowledge or so forth and so on. no you can come in and be yourself you know as long as you ain't saying nothing that we have to you know by law say your brother you know or sister you know can you be respectful but that's what it is so yeah we can we can uh, approach that question if you want to i kill right now you want to approach sure. that question or? very briefly and i don't, I don't allow uh right, okay. to make yourself the duck tail if you like and again i know right. we're, we're past time now okay. um well. firstly to 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 our our, our brother and our sheikh uh, abdul qadir may Allah preserve you alaikum assalamu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh um you're right and we are conscious of the fact that um there may be people that this reaches 
who will not be familiar with with some of the names that we mentioned. Uh, at the at the same time, uh, the first step is exposure, right? And I'm saying this because I was the one that mentioned I was the one that was name dropping scholars, right? Um, so so we have to begin with exposure um, to this so that people can become familiar with. While this may not be the platform to necessarily speak to the detail of who each individual is in their caliber, caliber to your point, I believe that's why you're making that point. Um, we, we do we do have to take first step in the process, number one. And number two, we also on this platform have to be very real and honest with regards to what our own experiences have been. And because our training uh, has come from these particular scholars and these particular personalities, um, at some point, we do have to give favor to them and reference them because it is simply our experience, right? And and um, again, to, to the thesis point, if we do need to expound, uh, we're, we're totally open uh, to to discussion and into building uh, the the WhatsApp group. The Fazer Club Q and A is is present, and many have already been engaging uh, in discussion, including uh, Chaplain Antigua, uh, including yourself, Sheikh Abdul Qadir, and we can continue to engage on these type of topics if we need to delve into further detail on a matter that isn't necessarily the primary topic of our discussion in a particular episode. Appreciate you all. Oh, the everyone that tuned in. But next time, you know, our brother, uh, Adul Haki, you already apologized, gave us his, his thing, inshallah, ta'ala, perfections with the law. So sometimes give us a room. We would like to start at 7 a.m., but give us a room. At least give us about a 20-minute room, man. You know, you know how we are sometimes. And, and inshallah, ta'ala, we keep you posted whenever we, we, we start. But we would like to start at 7. But if we, if, if we can't, give us that little bit grace period there. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, uh, hopefully make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel, please. Brother, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, make sure you like us up on uh, Facebook as well as on the Apple uh, Apple Podcasts. We do have uh, Apple Podcasts page. We're on there, the Fudger Club, and you can get each of the episodes that we do. And stay tuned for another one, inshallah ta'ala, and join us on Clubhouse. Um, this is your host, Nafis uh, Abu Zaid, and my host, my co-host. This is your brother, Akil Ingram. And, and this is your brother, Abdul Haq Baker. And we thank you all for uh, tuning into the Fudger Club. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.